uh, talk started. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, the October uh, ADEC program panel. Uh, I see we have a very good attendance uh, this time around and I am very happy to welcome uh, Stephen Downs as our speaker uh, this month and I thank Stephen for uh, jumping in so quickly to be honest because I just contacted you about two weeks ago uh, mm -hmm. and I really appreciate your willingness to uh, uh, to give a presentation on your research and on what you have been doing over the past years uh, to all of us. So I'm really excited about this. Uh, Stephen Downs is now with the National Research Council of Canada and uh, will talk to us about Beyond Instructional Design, Open Spaces and Learning Places. Stephen, thank you very much and we look forward to your presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I guess, am, am I getting a little echo there? <laughs> no, but I am getting I am getting voices. So uh, I'm going to ask the uh, participants if you could please mute your microphones, uh, unless you're talking to me. In which case, don't mute your microphones. You can open your microphones and talk to me at any time. Uh, one thing before we get started, very important, very also very important. I have not given up hope. Go Jays, go. Okay. <laughs> I had to put that in. So yeah, this uh, presentation was a little bit on short notice and of course as is usual for me, I, once I got into doing the presentation itself I sort of forgot exactly what I promised to deliver, but I'll mostly deliver on what I promised to deliver. What I have in mind today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the structural design, I'm going to talk to you uh, about stuff you already know have patience with me. Now the way this was originally supposed to work is there would be a beautiful little box of symmetries from the instructional design concepts to the environment concepts. It didn't really work out like that, but I'm going to try to make it work in the audio. The slides won't really reflect it, but the audio should reflect it. So that's basically the plan. and. Uh, Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, and I, I don't need that anyways. Okay, so I'm covering things I need with applications, which is never a good idea. It's always trickier, uh, I will say, presenting online because I don't have that immediate audience feedback. Um, so, and I always miss that because I really feed off of that. Screen sharing is now paused. Why would it do? Oh, I see. I'm just trying to minimize this. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so let's begin. Let's begin with the common ground. Let's begin with what we all know. And I, I've got a bunch of slides on what we all know, but I do want to touch on all of these concepts as we segue from design into learning spaces. So what is instructional design? Yes, I cited Wikipedia. No, I don't feel guilty about it. It's perfectly good. I had to edit the page a little bit to make it work for me, but uh, it's, that's, that's the way Wikipedia works. So what is instructional design anyways? The practice of creating instructional experiences which make the acquisition of knowledge and skill more efficient, effective, and appealing. Mostly effective. And the process in general and I'm drawing this from the Wikipedia argument, but I've seen this in, in so many different places, right? Where you begin with the current state and the needs of the learner. So the learner knows nothing or something, and they, they need to do something perhaps, uh, acquire a certificate, qualify for a job. And that helps us define the end goal of the instruction. Uh, my colleague, Rod Savoie, likes to depict this as the transition from state K0 to KN, where K0 is the present state of knowledge and KN is the future state of knowledge that is desired. And then there's some sort of intervention, whatever that is, and that's, of course that's the whole subject of instruction of design, that moves us from K0 to KN. So, this concept has some core concepts, and these core concepts constitute, if you will, the lore of instructional design. All the stuff that 
all of you would have learned as you're studying instructional design either on your own or in a formal instructional design classroom environment. One of the core concepts is the whole idea of taxonomies and types of learning. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it's, it's interesting that there are always taxonomies because you move from remember to understanding to applying, etc. Uh, why did it do that? Something changed. Hmm. Okay. Something changed, but I don't know what it was. So I hope you're still hearing me okay. Um, now, now I have a big blue. Oh, maybe. Never mind. So, but, you know, I mean, they, these aren't the only taxonomies. I was tempted to throw in the famous example of Dale's cone. Uh, I see and I, I remember 10%, I hear and I remember, etc. Uh, of course, Dale's Cone is a complete work of fiction, but it's a work of fiction that's been so compelling that over the years it's been cited by probably hundreds of instructional designers, maybe thousands of instructional designers. But the idea here is that there are different types of learning, different levels of learning, and that suggests something like a learning process. And so we, we get things like Gagne's nine events. If you count them, one, two, three, four, well, I get ten events, but it doesn't matter. Um, maybe it is ten events. I can never remember details like nine or ten. But the main point here is there's a step. Oh, this isn't Gagne. That's what the problem is. Whoops. There's a step-by-step -step process involved in learning. Uh, you know, Gagne begins with gain attention, et cetera, et cetera. You move through the different steps. And there's the idea of prerequisites, that you don't move on to the next thing until you're ready. You do the simple thing first, and then you do the complex thing, or you do the thing that is conceptually first, and then the thing that is conceptually second. And yes, I'm still citing Wikipedia. Another core concept, and this is more a meta concept, but is the, uh, I heard a big ding. You can hear me still okay. I don't know what the big ding was, but that's okay. Um, the, the meta concept of the instructional design process itself. And I'm sure you're, you're all familiar with the famous ADI process analysis, which is typically a needs analysis or a learning analysis. You go into an environment, etc. Design, development, implementation, and then evaluation. And this is evaluation of the learning intervention itself, evaluation of the learning design. The design process also informs what we might call the double loop. The single loop is, I'm, I'm trying to use my mouse on the slides, I don't know if you'll see my mouse on the slides, I don't know if that works, uh, but the single loop is the results inform your next learning event. The double loop is the results of the learning as a whole inform the design of the overall learning events or the overall, well it says here, cognitive strategies, mental models, models attitudes, etc. But the idea here the main idea here is that there's this feedback loop that informs the, the sequence or the process of learning and learning design. So more core concepts, there's this idea of learning involving transactional distance. And this, of course, is Michael Moore, defines it as a psychological and communication space to be crossed, etc. So the idea here, if you think about it, there's this message or this content that is being transmitted to you, and that's what these learning events essentially are. But what we're trying to do is find out if you have, in fact, received that content or that message, and so you send feedback to the person who sent you the message. It, it, always, it always reminds me of the computational process of the checksum. So if you're sending 
a signal from one computer to another. You're sending some data, and then you send a figure at the end, which is the checksum. And the checksum needs to match the data that you sent. And so the receiving computer looks at that and then sends you back information to say, yes, I received the information properly, or no, I did not receive the information properly. And this, of course, is related to the idea of assessment or evaluation. And again, what we're trying to do is determine whether this information that I sent you is being received and implemented correctly by the receiver, the student. Uh, did you get it? Did you translate it in your head properly? Are you able to use it? Um, and so through the development of instructional design over the years, there's been a realization that assessment needs to for perform both an educational function and an evaluative function, a function to help you learn, to move you along, to make sure that you're staying with the program, and then the final wrap-up, uh, here's your certification kind of assessment. Uh, learning design, again, is assessed pretty much on the same basis. Uh, we have what's called Kirkpatrick scale for the assessment of learning materials or learning resources or instructional materials and resources. From the B, you know, the lowest level is, uh, did people like it? Uh, you know, did they fill out the course evaluation with lots of good reports? All the way through to, were there any results from the learning? Did the person's behavior actually change as a result of the learning? This applies especially in workplace learning where Typically, the design of the learning seeks to achieve some sort of performance outcome. And I've read an additional fifth level uh, being added to Kirkpatrick's levels, asking, does it actually have a return on investment? Did it produce a financial benefit for the company or the corporation in question? But again, the idea is, did this knowledge get effectively transmitted and translated by the person at the receiving end. Yeah, and if you think about it, instructional design or learning design it is an information theoretic kind of discipline. And as you go back and, and analyze the different concepts, including all of these that I described here, and map them to information theory, you'll find pretty much a one-to-one -one mapping between instructional design and information theory. Uh, I'm moving too fast there. Um, so, for example, in information theory, we have things like signal versus noise. We have things like feedback loops. Uh, we, we have like, uh, uh, the, uh, the concept of information itself as, as being that data which changes your understanding or model of the world, where that may be defined as a change of behavior or right reaction to the world, etc. So, and, and so the idea is that it's a transfer of information from one person to another. And it needs to occur in, I don't want to say a fairly rigorous way because that's, that's too strong for what I mean, but in a fairly structured way. But there's a process here and you have to move step by step. And that the, the transfer of the information is pretty much in the hands of the sender and the sender has to send it out in the appropriate format. Uh, in the appropriate encoding and receive the appropriate uh, checkoffs by the person receiving it. So related to these core concepts of instructional design or learning design, we have learning technology that developed really beginning, well, at a bit beginning in the 70s and 80s, uh, but really for, for online or web technologies, pretty much beginning in the 1990s. So if we go back to the original idea of learning as being a way of moving you from K0 to K1, the intervention, the, the actual learning, would be provided to a person using something called a learning management system. And we're all familiar with learning management systems today. We've all used things like Blackboard, 
or desire to learn now known as Brightspace uh, or, or any of the others, uh, some of the earlier ones, Angel, WebCT, etc. And what these learning management systems would do would be to present in a sequence or order learning materials to people. I built a learning management system in the 1990s and what we tried to do is have people step through learning materials step by step by step. Um, Okay, still getting messages through. That's what the dings are, I guess. People saying things like, likewise, good. Um, over time, these learning management systems also came to support the actual process of instructional design or learning design. And we got what was called the learning content management system. And a, a learning content management system was basically a big repository of reusable learning resources. And it would be learning materials like texts, like lessons, like quizzes, etc. cetera. Uh, they'd be digital materials and they'd be stored in the content management system and identifiable and retrievable, ideally so that you could find the appropriate learning material in order to meet the needs of your learner and the learning objectives. And supporting this, was something called IMS Learning Object Metadata, which would describe to a precise level of detail, and I don't know if you can see the, uh, the uh, learning object metadata in the image that's on the screen, but you see things like the life cycle of, of the uh, resource. You see things like technical information, what kind of format is it in for presenting, but also information related to the educational activity or the pedagogy involved. So things like, excuse me, interactivity level, how interactive is this resource? Uh, semantic density, I, I just love that, uh, I love that term and it was never a term that anyone really understood but simply meaning how hard is it to read the text in this learning resource, what level of reading do you have to have. Um, intended end user role, is the end user uh, a grade five student, is the end user uh, a carpenter, whatever, difficulty, whatever that means. Typical age range, which is a wonderfully uh, not international way of doing it. Typical learning time, which again, uh, was a type of metadata that nobody could really agree on. But the idea here was that you would be able to classify all of these learning resources, organize them, and then present them as a nice neat course. And IMS actually developed another specification called content packaging in order to make that happen. So as this progressed and as this technology matured, IMS produced technologies that would actually assist in the instructional design process. And so we got things like content sequencing, which was a simple technology to put your learning objects, as they were called, in a sequence or an order of presentation. But of course, learning design involves more than just sequencing, you know, one thing, then another thing, then another thing, because, you know, you're, you're doing this interaction, you're doing this feedback, uh, and so there might be changes required in the sequence. You might need to uh, do this rather than that. You might need to repeat uh, a particular piece of content, etc. And so this, the early sequencing evolved into something called IMS learning design. It was based on Rob Coper's educational modeling language. And the idea was that uh, you would create a representation of a course such that as you went through the course, depending on what you did in the course, for example, did you pass the course, fail the course, or whatever, you might be presented this material or that material. And all the material that would be presented was described as a learning object. And these learning objects, if you're building one of these uh, sequences, you could search for the appropriate learning object according to the content, according to the learning object metadata. And so, and, and it's interesting because these got very complex uh, when uh, learning design was first introduced. We were invited to think of it as a play 
you know, the script for a play, the uh, instructor would be the director of the play, different students would take on different roles in the play, and then each student would follow this script, interacting with each other depending on what script told them to do. Um, Learning Activity Management System, or LAMS, uh, was created in Australia by James Dalzio, and it was a tool that enabled instructors and designers to create learning designs. So you, you're looking at, um, on the image there, uh, one of the designs created using LAMS, and as you can see, it's like a sequence again, um, but there might be some branching, there might be some loops, uh, there might be some pre-tasks and some assessments and so on. And it will involve the various parts or various types of learning activities such as discussion, uh, reading, responding to questions and the like. So that leads us to even more advanced technologies, although, you know, as you can see, each one of these is really just a smallish iteration over the previous one. And so adaptive learning now takes the concept of learning design, but allows the learning design itself to be adapted during the presentation of the learning resources according to the individual needs of each, uh, of each learner. If you see the illustrations there, the, the, the little dots, um, you know, the orange dots, and they're actually squares, but to me they just look like dots. They're different types of lessons in a mathematics course. So some of them are about equations, some of them are about statistics, some of them are about algebra, etc. And so you have this whole set of concepts that are covered in this course. And then the adaptive learning system looks at what the learner needs and maps out a path for that learner. But as you can see, we have two paths here, one for Lauren and one for William. And the two paths through the material are actually very different. They have different starting points and different endpoints. And they don't even need to touch on all of the individual concepts. They just need to touch on the stuff that they need, although they have to at least get through the same basic or core prerequisites. There are different ways of setting up adaptive learning, and I've listed a few of the models there. I took that straight from the Wikipedia page. But basically, the idea here is you gather information about the material to be taught, because there, it may be semantically related so that there's a logical structuring of it. Also, the information about the students, uh, what they've done, did they pass a quiz, etc., and other aspects of, of the uh, system and the environment in order to create this path through the learning materials. The key here, though, to keep in mind is, is just a fancier way of stepping people through these materials. And that leads us to the topic of the day, um, learning analytics. And you know, there's a, you know, the last few years there's been much to do about learning analytics. If if I had to, oh, I say okay. Uh, we forgive you for your microphone that keeps unmuting, um, and we'll blame the gods of computers. Uh, so learning analytics, really, if I had to characterize it, characterize it, and this is my characterization, I would call it something like data collection used to support adaptive learning. Now, George Siemens and crew in their learning analytics and knowledge conference called it the measurement collection and analysis, sorry, measurement collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners in their contacts for the purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. Which to me is just, you know, create better learning paths, um, mostly. Uh, as well, there's, there's another branch of analytics called predictive analytics, and these analytics are used to, to model likely learning outcomes to make predictions. And the, the classic case of this is if the person does not log into the system in the first week, the person is likely to fail the course, 
and a direct intervention by an instructor is recommended. That's a simple case of, of learning uh, analytic, predictive analytics in action. But again here, the idea here is still get the person from the state of K0 to Kn. Get that information into the person in such a way that that person is able to reach whatever those learning objectives are. And there we are. Today, a lot of the technology we have are to support that sort of picture. They can be used for different pictures, but the way they're typically talked about, typically understood, is in support of this fairly traditional picture that I've just drawn. Everything I've said to you so far should be stuff you're, you're sort of nodding along, yeah, yeah, I've seen that, I've seen that, I've seen that, I've seen that. It, it's a very typical picture. Actually, if you're really doing it right, you should be saying, I got this wrong, I got that wrong, I got that wrong, I expressed this incorrectly, etc. Uh, because I, I stepped through this very lightly and very informally. The technologies for social networks and learning, we have the idea of social networks being used to create this interactive environment where we can determine whether or not people are able to get the concept right by having them discuss this concept in a community and, and thereby send feedback to each other. Uh, so we have you know, John, uh, yeah, it's uh, John Drawn writing about social networks as formal learning environments. We have people like uh, Etienne Wenger talking about uh, learning communities, communities of practice. In this environment also to some degree come the MOOCs. Uh, a MOOC, the, the acronym stands for Massive Open Online Course. The original one was developed by George Siemens and myself about seven years ago now, it's hard to believe. It was a social MOOC or a C MOOC and the idea was to create conversation and discussion around a topic or an idea. But MOOCs quick, quickly transmogrified into what are called X MOOCs. The X MOOC is basically an open learning management system and they went back to that very same model of assembling some content creating a sequence of presenting that content and then because they're doing it in front of a massive number of people, doing it in a fairly strict regular order. <coughs> Finally, just to wrap things up a bit because there is a bit of a loose end, this idea of integrated environments, what I mean by that is where your learning management system, instead of having all of its learning objects and all of its learning tools inside the single environment could actually use external applications or tools in order to present some of these content, uh, contents or to perform some of these activities. And different ones do it in different ways. A learning management system, we use the IMS learning tools interoperability specification, for example, whereas Newton, which is an analytics tool, has its own way of accessing external tools and, and resources. All right, break time. That's the picture in a nutshell. Uh, it's really a bit of a caricature. Oh, that's a slide that's out of order. <laughs> Let's take the interlude. So, Clark Aldridge once identified some major types of digital games. He was doing it in support of his extensive work in game-based learning. And if you want to know about game-based learning, I recommend you go to his site. He's got information on tons of different types of games, uh, educational games, quote-unquote serious games, and so on. And these really break down, I've got three major types here. Uh, there might be other types, but these types will be enough to make the point. Now there's the quiz games, which are at the very bottom of Bloom's taxonomy, right? You know, they're, they're question answer. They're, they're like Jeopardy. You know, what is the capital of Liberia? And you either know it or you don't. It's it's a it's a, a memory question. It's Monrova. Monrovia. Monrova or Monrovia. If I don't get that right, Alex Trebek will uh, deduct points. Anyhow, 
But then the main kinds, the main two kinds of games are what might be called branch and tree game games and open-ended environments. And these are really, really different things. Branch and tree games are games where you go through a series of steps and depending on what happens, you might branch or you might loop and the idea is to get from one end to the other end successfully without hitting a dead end or without looping in, in forever or doing it faster than the other person, something like that. Uh, board games are often examples of this. Snakes and ladders, or for the British, shoots and ladders uh, is like that. And you're working your way through, and if you hit a snake, you slide down, and so that's a loop, right? And if you hit a ladder, you zoom up, and that's sort of like the negative version of a loop. Monopoly is like that. Trivial Pursuit is like that, except they have you uh, answer memory questions, so it's kind of a combination of the first two, but mostly it's some rent and tree games. Early video games were like that too, and I actually remember these. Now, these came out uh, in the 1980s. They, they actually came out before video games, and what they were, uh, the, the laser disc game, so a laser disc, I was going to say, a laser disc was about the size of an LP, and now I realize that's probably not helpful. But it was a it was a disc about 12 inches uh, or, or a third of a meter in diameter, and basically recorded on that disc. It's it's a precursor to the the compact disc format. Were videos, and so what the game did is it would show you one of those videos, and then it would give you a decision point. And then it would show you another video and a decision point. And so you would be presented the video, do something, presented the video, do something, and it would step you through. And sometimes you'd have to loop back, and sometimes you'd make a mistake, and you'd see a video of yourself dying and red stuff coming down, etc. And that was the game. But the thing is, people got bored of these games really quickly, and the technology never really took off. It was a very short-lived technology. Because, and, and you'd see people, uh, they'd be chatting with their friends, right, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, right, 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 left, right, left, right, left, right, 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 left. And they worked their way through the game. And, it, and so the branch and tree games basically became memory games. But they, they didn't have any semantic content, if you will. The, what was actually presented on the video could be anything, and it was meaningless, and it was always the same. Um, you know, every game you played was the same set of decisions. It was the same set of options. What happened in the world of, of games is that fairly quickly they moved into what might be called open-ended environments. Now, if, if you want to get a sense of what an open-ended environment is, think of any sport, hockey, baseball, football. You don't have predetermined steps. Uh, there, there, there might be formal or set plays, like you know, a corner kick in soccer or, or uh, you know, a, a, a scrum in rugby. But after that set play, whatever happens is very open-ended. What's happening here is you, you're, you, you don't have one person or a group of people moving from one step to the next step to the next step to the next step. Rather, what you have is an environment, a playing field, where individuals and sometimes objects interact with each other. And, and you know, in sports, usually there's just one object, a puck, a ball. A baseball has several objects, you know, gloves, bat, the baseball, the bases. Uh, and video games, after they basically the failure of, of, of laser disc games, and they really did fail. They, they were very nice, but, you know, eventually they just sat there. Pretty much every video game after the, the laser disc games were based on this open-ended environment. And this was the secret to their success, because every game you played was different. There wasn't just a, a limited set of things you could do. 
every time you played the game, you could try something different, get a different result. The objects themselves in the games might behave differently because they were independent objects. You know, this is this is why I hated Pac-Man, right? You could predict what the individual ghosts in Pac-Man would do. But if you were playing a more sophisticated game, like say um, uh, the Gauntlet, well even then you could kind of predict, but the more sophisticated, the less predictable the objects became and the more like an open-ended environment the video game became. And that's the kind of contrast I'm trying to draw with this talk. So let's bring that back around to instructional technology and instructional design and the like. On the one hand, we have a planned kind of environment. On the other hand, we have an open-ended kind of environment. This slide refers to the two things in the area of software development. In Waterfall, which I pictured here, there's a step-by-step -step process and you design your entire application, whatever it is, from the beginning. First you produce the requirements for it, that's like learning objectives, then you do an architecture for it, then you do the actual coding for it, you do some testing and after that all you have to do is maintenance and use. Uh, Agile is a different approach. In Agile you build the entire Environment, excuse me, the entire application, a very simple version of it, uh, they call it minimal viable product. You build that first and then you try it out and then you iterate on that. And the idea here is that your software almost becomes this environment that you're gradually building up and making better based on the interaction between your software and the end users of the software. With Waterfall, there's no interaction with the end users until it's rolled out. It's kind of like Microsoft Word, right? You never get to see it until Microsoft launches it. And the difference is that with Agile, the developers can actually work with and develop the application in a real environment, an authentic environment, whereas with Waterfall, they're designing according to specifications and feature requirements uh, which, are, which are all determined ahead of time. Okay, let's try that same distinction slightly differently. We have this idea of knowledge translation. Knowledge translation is a concept uh, it comes from healthcare originally, but the idea is that you have this scientific knowledge about healthcare. Getting vaccines is good. Uh, jumping off tall buildings is bad. Okay, but those are caricatures, obviously. But there are best practices. Uh, there are uh, you know, uh, known reactions of, of medicines, known therapies to particular diseases, etc. And the state of this knowledge is constantly changing as we discover more in healthcare and the idea here is that we want this new knowledge to be translated into behavior. So it's a transmissive process from the scientist to the practitioner and you can probably imagine right away the reaction to that. The practitioner who's actually working with patients in uh, an authentic environment often knows as much as the scientist about how effective a particular approach or a particular treatment might be. And that's what leads to the criticisms of the concept of knowledge translation, that it should do more than just focus on the no-do gap, if you will, the gap between K0 and KN, and instead think about uh, as I said, specific, situation-specific practical wisdom, uh, the wisdom of people who are on the ground, the knowledge that is tacitly shared among practitioners, tacit knowledge identified first originally by Michael Polanyi isn't knowledge that's not written down, it's knowledge that in a sense cannot be written down, cannot be formulated ahead of time. It's like when I was playing pinball. You, know, you play pinball, it's another one of these open-ended environments. You play pinball and 
there are ways of playing pinball you can't describe, but an expert pinball player knows them. And you watch each other and you can see, you know, and it's like, why do pinball players lean back and forth? They don't, all they're doing is pushing buttons. Um, but it's more than that. Uh, and then there's a lot of things about the knowledge that goes beyond the mere content, the complex links between power and knowledge, partnerships, et cetera, et cetera. So knowledge translation is criticized in the medical field. We need to do more, it is said, and I agree, than just transmit knowledge from the knower to the learner. So that takes us to the concept of design versus environment. And that's the path I'm going to take to, to close or, or to wrap up the presentation. So on the left-hand side, you have design. Design is the traditional instruction and design practice. Design is the traditional learning practice. The beginning, the focus is on the content, and then there might be some kind of practice after. The environment, on the other hand, is based on the practice first. You're not given part of a baseball field or part of a hockey arena, uh, and, and you're not even necessarily you know, sat down and told all the rules of the game. Uh, you get out there and you start playing the game. And that produces content. That produces content in the sense of, you've performed to a certain level, you've done certain things, you've had certain experiences, uh, you won the game, you lost the game, etc. So if we look at that in a little bit more depth, we have on the left hand side the traditional way, the content to practice way, so we begin by defining some ideal state, some sort of learning objective, some sort of performance objective, a Kirkpatrick measure or whatever, as compared to a desired state. The desired state is typically the, the, the thing that the person is trying to do. You see the difference between the two, and this is often used to characterize formal and informal learning. In formal learning, you design or you define a content domain that somebody's attempting to master. In informal learning, you're trying to accomplish something. You're wiring a house, you're, you're building an engine, uh, you're, you're, you're digging a well, uh, you're, you're trying to rotate a cube on a in a, on a computer screen, something like that. And so you try things out in informal learning. In, in formal learning, you learn the content and then you try it out. In informal learning, you try it out, you get a result. Now, typically in informal learning, the result is failure. <coughs> in formal learning, I'm, I'm pointing to the screen, this is not helping you one bit, <laughs> but in formal learning, uh, you might get failure as well. But there, there are two different kinds of failure here, right? Uh, in formal learning, the practice comes in the form of a test, and the person, the teacher, the instructor, or whatever, is the person who is assessing your performance and, if you will, identifying where you went wrong. But in informal learning, if there is a person involved, and typically there is, uh, you know, informal learning, self-directed learning does not mean learning all by yourself. Usually there's someone there, but this person is not testing you. This person typically is attempting to help you in some way. You've tried to dig a whale, uh, a well, not a whale. You tried to dig a well. For some reason you failed. You can only get three feet down and then the wall started giving in or whatever. And the person doesn't sit there and say, well, you've obviously failed at digging wells. The person tries to help you accomplish the goal or the desired state that you're trying to achieve. And so that creates the feedback loop. There's feedback loops in both versions. There's a feedback loop in formal learning, the, the single loop and double loop that I talked about earlier. There's a feedback loop in the environment-based approach as well, but they're very different. In the formal approach, you've identified a gap. 
This is that gap between K0 and Kn. It's that gap that is identified by adaptive software. And what happens is when you go back to the content, the content is now being issued as a form of correction of your mistakes. On the other hand, in the case of an environment, the result of your practice, which is content, and sometimes failure, is an opportunity. Uh, if I had to be specific, it's a learning opportunity, although you know, it, it might be any kind of unexpected opportunities. Uh, you, know, you, you try to score a goal, you, you don't succeed in scoring the goal, but you're able to see the way the other team reacted, and that suggests to you a better way of scoring the goal, if you will. Um, and so you try, and that gives you an opportunity, and that gives you what you need in order to go through another iteration. Think of it in terms of software design. Software design, formally, you're defining an ideal state, you build the software, and then the software is tested, and it produces bugs, and you correct the bugs and try to go back to the initial state. And eventually, you get rid of all the bugs, and you release the software, and it turns out to be something like Microsoft Clippy, which nobody wanted in the first place. On the other hand, if you're doing agile software design, right away you design an overall version of your application and then you try it out with people. And the people that you try it out with aren't people that are looking for bugs or errors in the program, well, they might find that, but really what they're looking for are opportunities or ways to improve what you've done. And so they give you that feedback and you go back and do the next iteration. So, these are two different ways of software design. There are two different ways of learning design. There are also two different ways of learning. And in the one kind of learning, we're looking at learning based on requirements. On the other kind of learning, we're looking at learning based on affordances. But even more important, more significant than that, it's the difference between what we might call personalized learning and personal and personal learning. In personalized learning, the person who is doing the teaching is in control of the whole thing. The person who is doing the teaching is in some way controlling the process, issuing the resources, defining the objectives, determining what it is that you need to know, and testing you and showing where you are wanting. In personal learning, this is learning you are developing for yourself. This is you trying to accomplish some sort of objective or goal, and in the learning environment, people or objects or whatever are there to help you and to improve whatever it is you are doing until you achieve the objective that you're doing, that you're trying to accomplish. Success, and it's not on the side, but success in these two different environments is very different as well. Success in formal learning means mastering all of the content. Success in personal learning means being able to do whatever it is you wanted to do. Success in formal learning means course completion, test scores, results. Success in personal learning means getting in, getting what you want, getting out, and getting something done. Very different pictures of learning. So that leads to the whole concept of personal learning environments. Personal learning environments, these are what we are developing at NRC uh, in what we call the Learning and Performance Support Systems Program. Personal learning environments are learning based on the environments approach rather than the formal or structured learning approach. Personal learning environments look like and are designed like environments. Uh, there isn't a presentation of a sequence of materials. Rather, what you are is in a digital environment where there is a set of objects or resources or people or whatever surrounding you. So here we have Michelle Martin's personal learning environment. Michelle Martin is sitting in the middle of this, and these are all a bunch of people and resources that Michelle has access to. 
what will they do? They're trying to do something, whatever it is. We don't know much about Michelle, but Michelle is trying to do whatever Michelle is trying to do. And all of these resources are available to be used as needed. They're not presented in the sequence, they're not organized for her. They might be filtered if you know if she has some good analytics, but they're not being designed as a learning sequence for her. So when George and I built our original massive open online course, that's the model that we had. And we told people there isn't a base of content that we're trying to get you to learn. What we're trying to do in our MOOCs is to put you into an environment where you can share resources with each other. And so we set up a system where one student could make a resource available, a second person could discover that resource using our MOOC, they might access the resource offline, and then they might refer it to a third student entirely. From the course provider perspective, and that was our perspective, the MOOC sat in the middle, that's that little blue box there with the word site that is too large to fit in the box. And we'd have student content coming in from everywhere, course content that we created or more likely we found wherever on the internet. And we would send this or make this available more accurately to subscribed students. These subscribed students can also take part in online events or they could take part in discussions or chats or write blog posts or whatever, and these all got fed back into the system. So as the discussion occurred, resources would be created, new resources would be fed back into the students. The students themselves were doing whatever they wanted to do in the sense of the different students had different objectives. Some wanted to learn about connectivism. Others just wanted to learn about MOOCs. Others were interested in the software we were using. Others just wanted to come into the course and insult us and call us communists. It doesn't matter. Whatever they wanted to do, that's what they were able to do. And then they got feedback or in some cases pushback and that was their experience from the course and they could continue to try to do what they wanted to do or they could consider themselves done and move on. From the student's perspective, the student is in the center of an environment composed of other objects, including people with whom they interact. It's just like a sports field. It's just like a hockey arena, except instead of battling them for possession of a puck to put in a goal, they're interacting with other people, interacting with resources, and getting interesting and always novel and always unexpected results. And that's what produces the learning. So the design is based on putting the learner at the center. Here are a few early personal learning environment designs, one by Scott Wilson, one by Tim Hand. And again, the idea here is there's this environment with connections to other objects in the environment, and these connections to other objects in the environment create affordances. They create possibilities for doing or accomplishing whatever it is that you're seeking to do or accomplish, which leads to our learning and performance support systems program. We're almost near the end. So what we've done is we've taken this concept of the learner or the individual at the center and we've made that more than just the individual person. We've created a type of data that we call the personal graph. And the personal graph basically constitutes the personal learning record. It's all the person's certificates, badges, records of their activities, test scores, assignments, uh, as well as all the objects that they come, have come into contact with and all the relations between all of these with each other that they've detected. It's in a sense a proxy for the individual's personal experience in this environment. You might think that it's almost like you know a baseball player has all of his stats like stat cast or a hockey player has you know, all of his game records etc. That's what this is like. The thing with the personal learning record though is it belongs to the person. It travels with the person. If the person goes to a different environment, the personal learning record follows that person. And the person shares 
only that part of the personal learning record that they want. It's not open for everyone to see. You know, you, you don't show everybody all your practice runs. You show people your best runs. But you keep track of your practice runs so that you as an individual can keep track of how you're getting better. That's me and my fitness goals, right? I'm not going to show you my fitness results because eh, not so good so far. But when I get more fit, yeah, then I'll share. So LPSS, the system, is based around this. We still have learning resources. We still have learning activities. We even still have learning analytics, but they're all surrounding the individual learner, and they constitute elements in an environment now rather than ways of sequencing materials in, uh, and learning activities. So stuff goes out, stuff comes in. Stuff that comes in are uh, lessons, courses, books, events, uh, references to people who might be mentors, etc. Things, properties, relations, and it's all organized into this graph. Big things like books uh, or videos or, or illustrations or whatever, we can store in our personal library and we'll store that in the cloud somewhere. That doesn't form part of the personal graph. I'm still pointing to the screen, I'm sorry. Uh, but we have records of these things in the personal graph, but the great big artifact itself is going to be stored in the cloud somewhere. Then there are the activities that we undertake in the environment. What kind of activities do we undertake? Well, it really depends on us. But you know, there there are typical learning activities. Uh, you know, I might read or watch stuff. So I might uh, read an open educational resource. I might watch a video uh, on YouTube. I might take a, a massive open online course or whatever. I might play with toys, simulations, games, anything that helps me practice or or, or, or simulate uh, the kind of thing that I'm attempting to practice. The really common thing here is, uh, you know, like aircraft simulations for people who are learning to fly. Uh, we have a simulation which is a, a drone pilot simulation, so that you can learn how to pilot a drone without crashing your drone because they're expensive. Um, things that you make, uh, any videos, other artifacts, blog posts, essays, whatever you make. That's part of your learning activities. And so you make stuff in this environment and then you share it with other people in the environment, or you can store it in your personal library, etc. And then the analytics service, and sorry about the really big text there, it's not learning in in a, anyhow. Um, but the learning analytics gives your system some smarts and analyzes the stuff that comes in, for example. Um, it makes recommendations. So, you know, because there might be 20 million objects in your environment, you'd like to see the top 200 of them. You need a tool to help you do that. The analytics will also let you assess your own performance. Um, how well is your performance improving? Uh, are your activities in one area, such as flying a drone, helping your activities in another area, such as flying an airplane, etc.? So. This is kind of a messy slide, but it talks a little bit more about the details of each of these major areas from data information retrieval to data synchronization to the recommendation that I talked about and performance trans algorithms. So the resource repository network brings resources from around the world and brings them to you to be organized uh, the metadata in your personal graph and those things that you want to keep in your library. If you're wondering what that picture is, I'm still pointing at pictures, uh, that's the raw materials for salsa that was made at our table in the Mexican restaurant, which kind of blew my mind because I never knew you could just make salsa like that. Um, the resource repository network discovers sources, maintains your authentication, you know, all the things you need to do in order to interact with these objects that are out there in the world. Here's another way of representing the resource repository network on the left are all the different sources of information, email, SharePoint, Facebook, government sources, uh, learning management systems, etc. 
what we do is we bring it in, we parse it, we scrape it, we analyze it, we do an entity extraction, and then that builds our graph, and our graph is composed of things like articles, photos, persons, publishers, opportunities, job opportunities, competencies, uh, certificates, and even certificates, and so on. Personal cloud is, the, is your personal library, which might be stored anywhere on the cloud, and the idea here is to just enable storage of your, of your large resources on the cloud so that they're available in any of your devices, because, you know, you don't want to just use one device. Oh, I'm seeing a long chat. Uh, how would you see this concept working out of the contact out in the context of a formal course? Is an institution seen just as a resource slash data provider slash badge issuer slash API issuer? Uh, short answer, and then also we have uh, Robert asking, what is the role of the instructor in this? Uh, Move this window away from oh, little notification killed my screen sharing. Isn't that interesting? Um, so those are interesting questions. So the role of the instructor is the role of this person who supports, right? So the role of the instructor now is no longer to define what is to be learned, define the content, define what mastery of the content looks like and test the person. That's a very traditional role, but it's not particularly helpful to the learner. What the learner needs is someone to help them accomplish whatever it is that they're trying to do. So the instructor on this picture becomes a resource like a learning object, except less digital, that a person can access in order to help them understand the things that they need to understand or, or help them see their way to accomplishing their goal. So this assistance might come in various forms. This assistance might come in the form of content recommendations. This assistance might come in the form of, uh, uh, you know, descriptions of underlying principles or concepts, in other words, you know, presentation of, of very, very personalized information. Uh, this, this, this assistance might come in the form of coaching and encouragement. Uh, I wrote a paper once called The Role of the Instructor uh, where I broke all of these things down, but the idea here is now the instructor becomes this kind of helper person like a coach, like a mentor, like a trainer, as opposed to uh, a teacher or a principal on evaluating. You see the difference, right? How might this all work in the context of formal learning? That's a darn good question. Now, clearly the elements that I'm describing can all be used by a person in a formal learning environment. The way I would see it is we go back to the RRN, the, uh, the course might be in a learning management system like Desire to Learn or Coursera. The course content, or at the very least the reference to the course, uh, might be accessed by the LPSS system, and so the person could take the course through LPSS. Why would they want to do that? They're taking a formal course. Well, while they're taking this formal course, LPSS is providing them access to a range of resources relevant to the course from outside the course. So you're not stuck depending on the materials that are in the course. You have your entire you know, previous history of resources and contacts that you can draw on to help you through the course. Another message. This Messaging system in GoToMeeting is tiny, tiny, tiny. I have to lean way over to see it. Um, and there was no message. It just dinged, but there wasn't a message. So I don't know why. Uh, Agile, oh, here's another comment. Agile is so much easier to pivot with than waterfall. Absolutely. Uh, requirements change. If, say, requirements change, or they're not well-defined up front or at the start of a project. You know, it's funny, 
and we've discovered that just building LPSS. We're using agile uh, design methodology to build the LPSS system. That has its good points and its bad points. The bad point is our first, first release was really crappy. I'll say that. Uh, but the good point is that we can build on that, build on the feedback from that, from each other, and also from our initial set of users, and, and change direction. Another one of these stupid notifications. Change direction um, to, to turn the application into a different direction than we expected. We started off doing this uh, personal learning environment like I just described. And partway through the project, uh, from that building over there, can you see it? No, you can't see it. There's a building over there uh, with a project called Concierge in it. And they wanted a system that would connect small and medium-sized enterprises to resources such as experts in their domain, uh, funding programs that would help them out, uh, and local events. Well, same concept as open-ended learning. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, we're, you know, the, the small to medium-sized enterprise is defining their objectives. They're trying to do things. They're trying to access resources, skills, capacities, talents in order to achieve their objectives, which is usually making money in some way. So we're developing an agile. Uh, environment, so we were able to pivot enough with our development process to encompass that kind of objective within the scope of LPSS. So it's not just you know a place where people go to get certifications for on-the-job training. It's a place where small and medium-sized enterprises get the kind of support and resources they need in order to accomplish their goals. And that led us in turn to doing things like, well, maybe we could analyze the capacities and the competencies of people in the federal civil service and make them available to fill what we call micro missions or assignments in other government departments. And now we've been engaged in a project which allows us to do that. So, and that's what Agile allows you to do. And that's what, you know, not defining everything up front allows you to do. You know, a person's education changes. It changes over the course of a life. It changes over the course of a year. It changes over the course of a single class. And so defining it all ahead of time and then presenting it to them in this sort of sequence where everything is determined by the instructor is, to my mind, not an effective way to proceed to, you know, to max, uh, I want to say it without being trite. I was going to say to maximally efficientize or whatever, but uh, you know, it, it, you're not going to get the best value from your educational experience if you define it all ahead of time and then march it out like some kind of predefined program. And so that's what this technology is allowing a student to do, uh, you know, an individual person to do, the same way we as a project are trying to do. The personal learning assistant is the tool that should help them access and work with the resources that are out there, whether they're online events, whether they're learning resources, whether they're a one-to-one -one interaction with a mentor or an instructor or a technology advisor or whatever. So, and, and the PLE, or sorry, the PLA should bring back information about the individual and store it. Uh, there, there's a bunch of different technologies for this. There's, uh, there's the IMS Caliper uh, specification. There's also Advanced Distributed Learning's uh, Experience API or XAPI specification. Uh, and we're, we're supporting that. And the idea here is as you do activities in these remote environments, as you do activities in a simulation or in a discussion area or whatever, it's recorded, it's brought back, it becomes part of your personal learning record, and it becomes part of the information that you can use in order to determine are you succeeding in the thing that you wanted to do um, and, and to suggest 
to yourself ways that you might improve. But it, again, it's very open-ended. It's more like getting feedback from a training system, which tells you how far you walked, than getting feedback from uh, an instructor who tells you you did not walk enough. Um, I keep hearing more beeps, but I'm not seeing more messages. Uh, oh, wait, here we go. Andrew has to run to another meeting. Okay, fair enough. Um, and Oliver saying, thanks, Andrew. Okay, so I'm virtually finished here. And so and, and I'll, I'll make that actually happen now. So here we have the personal learning uh, assistant collecting XAPI information from a medical simulation. This medical simulation is something that we've also developed here at National Research Council. And again, it's a way to practice brain surgery without using real brains because we find that's a lot easier on the real brains. Uh, and then. The ACDR is the analytics part, but the purpose of analytics for us, again, isn't to sequence materials, it isn't to create some kind of adaptive learning, rather it's to make recommendations and also to analyze contents, give you more information about the environment that you're working in and about your interaction in the environment. But the choices about what to do are up to you. So, Personal learning records, I've mentioned this several times, is the heart, it's the data owned by the individual, shared only with permission from uh, by the learner with external agencies, uh, with learning management systems, with Facebook. This way, you do not become the product that some other entity is trying to sell. Uh, you own and manage your own learning for yourself. And that's basically the quick overview of LPSS from the perspective of a contrast between the environment that we're trying to create as opposed to the more structured kind of content-based, uh, design-based approach that is fairly typical in traditional instructional design. So with that, I'll end the formal presentation and I heard more bells, but I don't see more messages. So if there's any comments, questions, et cetera, I'd be happy to take them from you. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. This was a very interesting and stimulating and also thought-provoking presentation. Uh, I, I really uh, wanted to have a little bit of time to discuss things, but we are a little bit over time. Uh, so I apologize if some people have already left. Um, they might have other responsibilities, unfortunately, so they couldn't stay uh, around. I'm it's wondering. Totally my fault. No, it's not. It's not. I think because it's really important to to uh, lay the foundation for what you what you were talking about later uh, on about the um, connectivism and uh, the individual and personalized learning experience. So uh, I was trying, as you were talking about this concept, I was trying to fit it into a, let's say, graduate level course, because that's the environment I'm teaching in. So mm -hmm. let's say I've got a graduate level course entitled Pharmaceutical Chemistry 1 or something like that. Um, would I then at the beginning ask students what they want to get out of the course for themselves? Or do I still define learning outcomes in order <laughs> to get everybody to still get to that point where at the end when they come to a comprehensive exam, for example, that still everybody learned the same amount that I want them to get out of it? So that's a really hard thing because it's you know sort of like asking if I'm trying to think of an analogy off the top of my head, but it's not good. Uh, can you use a train to do the same thing? Or can you use an airplane to get to places the same way you can with the train? Uh, and you can. You maybe shouldn't, but you can. Uh, okay, that's what I get for trying to pick out analogies very quickly off the top of my head. Uh, you know, I mean, my first question, if, if I was doing a graduate seminar, uh, would be something like, why are you here at all? Right? It's not, what are you trying to get out of the course? It's, why are you here? Because that might be different. Um, you know, the, the one presupposes that, okay, I'm in the course, I might as well get what I can out of it, and the other doesn't presuppose that. Uh, it presupposes a wider set of possible objectives. 
uh, one of which is served by being in the course. And the difference is, you know, uh, the reason the person's in the course might be because they want to get their degree and get a good job. Um, but, you know, what are you trying to get out of the course? Typically, a person will talk about, you know, I want this knowledge, I want that knowledge, I want some other knowledge. You know, something that is framed by the expectations of being in that course. So, you put it in the context of the comprehensive exam, and that actually reflects uh, a situation or state of affairs that's fairly common in corporate learning where people are attempting to achieve some sort of certification uh, or some sort of credential in order to continue with their work. And in that environment, the objective is to, if you will, pass the test. Uh, now, I, I state that badly, but let, let's just leave it at that, pass the test. And, and the same with the comprehensive exam. The objective is to pass the comprehensive exam. Uh, different programs have different kinds of comprehensive exams. Um, when I took comprehensive exams in philosophy, they were kind of open-ended, um, which I really liked, uh, in the sense that, first of all, I, I picked a subset out of the set of all possible comprehensive exam topics. I chose philosophy of mind and epistemology, modern philosophy, philosophy of science. Those were the things I was strongest in. But then even within each comprehensive, the process was you define the question that you want to ask and then you set about answering the question. So in this case, the question that you might ask at the beginning of your graduate seminar might be, what questions are you trying to answer in order to pass your comprehensive exams? That's a bit different from, you know, can you, you know, I want to pass the uh, hazardous material safety program, but it's still kind of the same thing because it's like asking, what kind of knowledge do I have to have in order to achieve this hazardous material safety program? But, you know, we're, we're shifting it from, mastery of content per se to solving some kind of specific problem uh, or answering some kind of specific question. And I put it that way because when you put it that way, you move away from the idea that there is some base of content that everybody must know. Certainly, I you know again, you know, my, my experience with uh, comprehensive exams and other disciplines is limited, or more accurately, non-existent, you know, as I haven't sat in any chemistry comprehensive examinations, probably never will, although it would be an interesting thing to see. Um, but you wouldn't expect people studying at that level to all be mastering the same kind of content. You would actually expect each of them to master or, you know, to answer different questions, to approach the material in different ways. They're, they're trying to actually achieve something that is fairly individual. And even with the people trying to achieve their hazardous uh, material certification, uh, you wouldn't expect them, you know, I mean, they, they might all know a certain base of materials, you know, no matches, no propane. That's a good one. But they might each approach that knowledge in a different way. A smoker might look at it one way, a non-smoker might not even think of some of the things that might happen that a smoker might imagine, or, or might not subject propane to the same sort of risks that a smoker might. Again, me pulling examples off the top of my head. The, the point here is that by focusing on what they're trying to accomplish, we get away from the presumption that there's a standard set of content a standard set of materials, a standard approach, and that opens up the, the, the range of possibilities. And now, especially in a graduate seminar, you're now in the happy place where a person is basically designing your course for you. For you. So what part of answering this question is my particular expertise going to solve? is now the question that you're putting to this person, or how can I help you answer this question on your comprehensive exam? And, and then each person will answer that a bit differently. 
and that's kind of a roundabout way of, of, of addressing the question. But again, I need to be roundabout because I'm tempted to say, well, I make this knowledge available, I make that knowledge available, etc. Uh, you know, I have this learning theory, which is a very simple learning theory. Uh, part of it is to teach is to model and demonstrate, and that's probably the most you can do. Um, in, in this particular context, the modeling and demonstrating you can do needs to be responsive to and supportive of whatever the person is attempting, whatever question the person is attempting to answer in the comprehensive exam. I think this, this concept is, is fascinating because it really puts uh, the student or the learner in general it, not only in the driver's seat instead of just a passenger or a passive intake uh, seat or just sitting in, in a lecture and just being, you know, like a Nuremberg mm -hmm. funnel to just absorb knowledge, whatever. Uh, and and uh, But it also, they, they really are responsible for learning, for yeah. uh, for finding their own uh, passion also in that regard. Uh, I've got just the issue of um, how do I in the end then ensure still that somebody who graduates with a master's in pharmaceutical chemistry knows you know, some of the, the basics, as you said. Um, how do I define that? How do I make sure that everybody at the end comes out with, with that set of knowledge that uh, are likely going to be required for them in, in the industry setting. So that's kind of, you know, I, I really like the concept mm -hmm. of uh, shifting the responsibility to the individual student say, okay, you choose a topic that you are really interested in and you present it to the rest of the class or share resources with the rest of the class. And then others, others give you feedback on that, and I will jump in and just guide you if there is really something that goes completely off the beaten track or completely is completely in the wrong direction or something like that. I like that approach, but uh, do you think that learners are always open to that? Do they, because, you know, the, the current model of teaching and learning is really like, you are there as a student, you are just acquiring that knowledge, and people get into the habit of just sitting there and expecting to be spoon-fed knowledge yeah. instead of actually developing critical thinking skills. So it's it's also a cultural issue that has to do with that, isn't it, to some degree? Sure. So there's a few questions embedded in your comments. Uh, one question about how do you know someone's actually accomplished what they need to do to be given a master's? Uh, another question, uh, do students really want to do that? Um, and then even the other one about the cultural expectations. So let's approach them in more or less in that order because that's how I answered them in my head. And that's the only way I can remember them now. Uh, so with the first one, let's rethink for a moment what we think knowledge is. Um, on the formal picture, knowledge is a, is a set of facts that you've stacked up one on top of the other. And really that's what you're doing when you're learning. You're being presented with a fact, you remember it, you integrate it, you move on. You, you present it with another fact, you integrate it, you move on. Right. So you're, you're assembling these contents. And the whole process is about making sure you've acquired the contents properly and you've assembled them in the right way. And this applies, as an aside, equally to instructivist models and constructivist models. You're, it's still about receiving and assembling contents. It's just in constructivist models, you're doing some of the assembly yourself rather than having all of that done for you by the instructor. But that's not what knowledge is. Um, Knowledge is non-propositional. Uh, the, the traditional theory of knowledge is something along the lines of knowledge is justified true belief or some such thing. Right? The key thing here being that people think of beliefs as being constituted of propositions which may be true or false right? and, and knowledge are the true ones. Uh, and a proposition is a semantic construct in a language encoded 
with reference to either an external world or a model of the external world if you're a constructivist uh, or, or some such thing. There's different ways of describing that. But core to this idea is what's called the physical symbol system hypothesis. So basically, you're requiring these symbolic representations and you're implementing them in your mind into this physical symbol system. Your brain basically, as, as Wittgenstein said, the world is a totality of facts. Uh, but Wittgenstein, when he said that, and he later acknowledged, was wrong. And knowledge is not that. And, and this is the, the, the core, it, in my version at least, of connectivism. I'm not sure it's so sure it's core for George Siemens. It's definitely core for me. If we go back to the picture that I built of the uh, uh, of the personal learning environment, I'm going to jump way back to it really quickly. So this picture literally is what knowledge is. Now it's it's a crappy picture, right? Because it's it's really a, a hub and spoke kind of network. So pretend it's a much better picture of a network where things are really fairly tightly integrated and also pretend that there are many more dots than you see here instead of hundreds as we see here, thousands, millions, billions, in the case of a person, billions. Our knowledge is precisely that assemblage of connections between, in the case of a human, between neurons. Our knowledge precisely is a set of connections between neurons in our head. In society, it's a set of connections between individuals in a society. Uh, in crickets, it's the set of signals, chirps by crickets that are heard by other crickets. Crickets don't really know a whole lot because uh, it's a very simple network. Uh, societies and people are much more complex and they know a lot more. So, how do you know somebody's neural net is appropriately constituted? Well, you could get them just to recite facts, but there's no correlation between the recitation of a fact and the having of the appropriate neural network. Well, okay, I shouldn't say there's no correlation. There's a very loose correlation. Right? You can't really say Paris is the capital of France unless you have some concept that Paris is the capital of France. But you could just be aping the words. You could just be repeating something that somebody said without any concept of what that means. Knowledge, when knowledge is a set of connections between an individual, or sorry, a in set of connections between neurons within an individual, isn't a set of facts and isn't manifest as a set of facts. It is, one way of saying it is, it is manifest through recognition. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, knowledge is like knowing where Waldo is. If you've ever seen Where's Waldo, it's a really complicated picture, and there's a little guy in the center that you have to work really hard to find, and once and eventually you find him. He has a characteristic striped shirt and tall hat. Once you know where Waldo is, you can't unknow it. And every time you look at that picture, you can say, oh, yeah, there's Waldo. It's really hard the first time, but later you know it. You recognize Waldo when you see him. Knowledge is like picking out your mother as she walks towards you through the train station. Your mother, your recognition of your mother is not, a constant, not constituted in a series of propositions. You didn't say, I'm looking for the person who's five foot four, who's wearing a purple jacket, who has a green purse, and uh, etc. cetera, right? Uh, it's an instant snap to awareness. You recognize, and what has actually happened is you are presented with a visual phenomenon and a certain part of your neural network has become activated and that part that's activated activates more of your, your neural net 
which is your memory of what your mother is. It's your mother. So knowledge, in short, is recognition. You might now be asking, well, what does that have to do with knowing whether or not somebody has earned a master's? Well, think about how you do it, really. Not, not, not how the books say you do it or whatever. How you actually know that somebody's passed their master's. Well, you could give them a set of test questions, maybe true-false questions or whatever, and they'll give you all the answers, and if they get the right answers, you give them a master's. But we know that that's not what we do, except maybe MBAs. But really, what we do is we sit them down in a room with two or three or four experts, and we talk. We talk about their dissertation, typically, uh, if they've done a dissertation. We talk about the subject. It's an exam of some sort. There's always an exam. Sometimes, you know, in some programs, it's all done in writing, and then you have to read what they've written. But, but typically, there's an oral component. You sit down, and what you're trying to do, you and the other experts in the room, is you're not trying to answer a certain set of facts. You're presenting yourself or giving yourself an experience of this person such that you at some point during that meeting will recognize this person is a master. And a lot of that's ineffable. You know, a lot of that's tacit. Your, your neural network is mostly sub-symbolic. And it's really hard, it's, it's, in fact, it's impossible, literally impossible, to state the necessary and sufficient conditions required to become a master, uh, at least to pass that oral exam, right? It, it, you know, it takes it takes a certain savvy and know-how on the part of the master student, and it takes even more savvy and know-how on your part. We can get at it a little bit. Does the person use the words correctly? Um, you know, if if a person's a philosopher and they use the word ontology, do they use the word ontology to refer to the taxonomy of objects in the world? as opposed to, do they say, oh, I put my ontology to bed last night. Uh, you know, things like that. And a domain or a discipline is composed of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of little things like that. It's the knowledge that Thomas Kuhn said, the, the tacit knowledge that you need in order to be able to solve the problems at the end of the chapter. The problems at the end of the chapter cannot be solved simply using the information presented in the chapter. You have to take this, if you will, intuitive leap in order to solve the problems. And this intuitive leap is characterized as thinking like a physicist or thinking like a historian. You know, it's knowing the terminology, having the set of values, uh, understanding what questions are important and what questions are not, understanding what would constitute the answer to a question, what would constitute evidence or non-evidence in your discipline, etc. So you're sitting there in your examination and your neural net is functioning and what you're trying to do, well, well you're trying to get through to the end, but, but what, what your neural net is trying to do well, it's not even trying. It either will do this or it won't do this, but it will or won't snap to or recognize that this person is a master based on all of these subtle cues. It's, 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 a, and it's a system that's fraught with error, prone to prejudice, um, you know, and, and you know, especially if you only have three or four people in the room, it's really hit and miss. It's the same process that, that referees use to evaluate articles. Uh, the referee at a certain point will say, yes, this is a publishable article. No, it's not. Um, and then they'll make up the reasons to justify that. Um, but it's fraught with error, it's fraught with prejudice. It, it's fraught with uh, the symptoms of, uh, you know, I, I know what I like. Um, it's fraught with, uh, this is something that speaks to my discipline as to another. I can go on. Overall, so how are you going to do it now? 
that's what you're going to do. You're going to sit down with them in a room and recognize whether or not they're an answer. They will talk about their answer to the question. You will listen attentive, attentively, and at a certain point, you will decide, yes, this person has the kind of knowledge that I would expect, the level of knowledge that I would expect of a person who's received that degree. Not some kind of core competencies, not kind of some kind of uh, foundational facts, but just the, the language, the manner, the demeanor, the professional attitude, the way of looking at evidence and data, that's what you'll do. In the longer term, which is far more interesting, in the longer term, this same process, exactly the same process, will be undertaken not by two or three individuals, but by the wider community as a whole. Because the person who is learning to be a master's will work not just with you, not with just with a small number of people in the class, but they'll work in the wider social environment. They do that anyways now, it's just most of it's ignored. Uh, but they will do it even more so in the future, particularly in an environmentally based learning uh, environment. You know what I mean. Um, so there's more interactions. They talk. They're talking to more people. Uh, they're writing more things and sharing them. They're solving more problems, etc. And the performance of that person over time will be recognized or not by others as having a certain level. How will we know that? Well, the other people will start treating them the way that they treat other people who have reached that level. They will talk to them seriously. They will ask them questions. They will ask their opinions. Uh, when their opinions are sought, they will be listened to and sometimes followed. They will see evidence of actual problems being solved and so on. And Oh, <laughs> it disappeared. Oh, there we go. And so on. And so the same process of recognition will take place, but instead of you and two or three other professors, it will be the wider network of their peers who they interact with who are already recognized as experts in that discipline. And that will probably be done automatically rather than individually by a person. That will probably be done by an analytic system, the same kind of analytic system that we are today doing to detect and predict a person's performance in an online learning environment. So I think it's, it's, it's possible and interesting um, there, there are risks, of course, but that's what the process will be. The second question was, do they want to do this? Um, and, and the third one is sort of like that, too. And right now, no. Because right now, their objective is to get a certificate and get a job. And the less they can do, the better. And the easier it is, the better. Over the long run, however, as personal and economic success begins to depend more and more on social success, over time they will come into a learning environment seeking not simply sets of facts that they can memorize, but rather tools, strategies, skills, etc., that they can use to adapt and prosper in the social environment. In other words, to be successful at being recognized as an expert in the field. Really long-winded, I'm sorry, but, but it's a hard story to tell. And I really appreciate you t taking the time above and beyond uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the actual webinar. So I really appreciate that, Stephen. And I think especially when it comes to the cultural environment, uh, no matter if you are in the Canadian or the US or the European or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. they might all be a little bit different, but uh, we still strive at the moment for a very um, teacher-centric uh, environment, learning environment, where students are more, more passive receivers uh, and, and get knowledge delivered mm -hmm. to them instead of 
you know, developing these skills. So uh, I think this is a fascinating topic and we could talk about that probably much longer. <laughs> but uh, I really yeah. appreciate you taking the time today uh, to talk to us about this. And I, uh, uh, I appreciate everybody stopping by today. And uh, Stephen, uh, I'll be in touch with you after this uh, seminar, uh, if that's All okay. Right. Sure, and, absolutely. And I'm sure uh, we will um, we will have a, a few follow-ups with you as well. Uh, so uh, if I can, I will. Yeah, you have your your website up there, so that will also be mm -hmm. uh, visible to everybody who uh, watches uh, the recording later on. Great. Yeah. Uh, by all means, contact me. Follow up. Uh, you know, I'm, as you, as you can tell, happy to discuss this stuff with people because it's to me it's really interesting and, and fascinating. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you taking the time and have a great evening. Uh, and uh, talk to you later. Thank you. Talk to you later. Good night. <laughs> Good night.